afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Contact in the welcome. Desert. Stephen Greer. Thank you. Thank all of you, and uh, I'd, I'd really like to th thank the folks who invited me here and uh, all the volunteers. We have about 15 volunteers supporting our effort here this weekend. So a big shout out to all those guys. Thank you, Merrill and all. Yeah, thank you. So I'm sort of on a um, nonstop travel tour right now. You know, the movie Unacknowledged has just come out. It's the number one on iTunes. And uh, uh, it's actually beating the new Richard Gere movie. So Stephen Greer or Richard Gere, so I mean, <laughs> And uh, we're very grateful for that, and it's thanks to all of you. How many people here contributed to the crowdfunding for that? I'm just curious. A big thank you to all these folks. That's how the movie got made. Now, this was not a big Hollywood production. It was uh, 5,000 people contributing everything from $5 to well, 111,000 100,000 euros from a German couple uh, to make this happen. And the book, which is out there, has about 10 times more information than the movie. So if you've seen the movie, uh, you really need to read the book. And the purpose in it is for, this is a tool every one of you can use to give to anyone you know who is open-minded or even not open-minded about the subject. We're getting feedback from academics and skeptics of all types who are saying, we had no idea there was all this material. And so this is not really, this, this film and the book were not made for people who live and breathe this stuff on the internet day in and day out, like many of you might. It's really made for the other seven billion people on earth who we have to have compassion for, who have been disinformed for 70 years on a subject of the greatest importance to our future. And, and I think that's why we made it in a, in, a, in, a, in a manner that every single person on earth who would see it. And I can't talk about, but there's some things that are going to happen in a few months where uh, around 100 million people will see it. 100 million. So our goal... <laughs> our goal is to, to have this become sort of the... the arrowhead, like those chevron-shaped ships that fly over us. <laughs> we had over at Joshua Tree, actually, not long ago. And those are from the Arcturan star system, by the way, if you're curious. Uh, and these, this effort is really to, to push into the mass consciousness of the world, because it takes a certain mass consciousness shift to make things happen. And I have always said for 20-some years, if the leaders, if the people will lead, the leaders will have to follow. But the people haven't been leading. We haven't been doing enough. And this is uh, where we need, I'm going to consider this, and by the way, welcome to all the thousands of people watching on the webinar right now from all over the world. This is being live streamed uh, as well. We need to go through something very advanced here because I consider you guys to be the vanguard in the disclosure effort, in the effort to make contact with these civilizations peacefully, and in fact, to create a new civilization on Earth. And to do that, you've got to understand and have discernment between what's information and what's disinformation. And that discernment is very hard to come by, because if you go to most conferences, or go on the internet, and unfortunately even on things like Gaia TV, you're going to get one part information, five parts disinformation. And the reason for that is that people are doing it deliberately, not the, necessarily the people being interviewed and given talks, but the people who are providing that information to those folks. So the very first thing we want to go through today is how counterintelligence works. Now, I, I'm just a country doctor, lives in Virginia, but here's what I've found out about this, and it's been 27 years of a tutorial for me 
that I'm going to share with you. Uh, and it's not going to be a pretty story. Uh, it, it, some of this is going to be deeply disconcerting to people. It would be the opposite of what we're doing tomorrow night when we're doing contact out under the stars using uh, the, the mantras and sacred Vedic knowledge and higher consciousness and all of that. This is going to be a journey through uh, the national security state as it has devolved from a rather modest and small operation before World War II to the monster it has become today. And this monster, beginning in 1947, is, it was hatched in the cradle of Roswell. And the reason for it, and if you've seen, the, how many people have seen the movie Unacknowledged? All of you by now? If you hadn't, I don't know what rock you're living under. Um, go see it. It was shown for free when it was <laughs> here. If you didn't see it here, I don't know when you're going to see it. Um, here's, here's the issue. The entire national security apparatus got transformed when they realized that they had finally shot one of these objects down. Now, I say shot, shot it down. What do I mean? There are electromagnetic weapons, Tesla-type coils, that were being worked on in the 20s, 30s, 40s that are scalar, longitudinal type weapons. Now, these are weapons that, if you understand what a wave of, of, of light is, it has a wave component and, of course, a photon, the particle component. But it's a wave like this, right? And the speed of light is what? 186,000 miles per second. So every second, light goes 186,000 miles. A scalar or longitudinal wave, it's a point that is outside the wavelength of light, and it is actually propagated at multiples of the speed of light. Now, this has been studied for the better part of a century, but unfortunately has been weaponized and began to be weaponized. The FBI memo that you saw in the film Unacknowledged, if you study it, read it carefully, and then look at also other documents that we have, the electronic warfare systems were stood up between World War II and 1947, in those years of the, of the early, because they realized that there were these ET crafts zipping around our aircraft in World War II. You know what they were called? Foo Fighters. Yes, there is a band named Foo Fighters, and I'd say 99% of the kids I talk to go, well, that's a rock band. I said, yeah, but before that, it was what UFOs were called in World War II. And a member of my team, who was the original researcher on cattle mutilations, we'll get to this in a moment, uh, Dr. Altshuler, he was a very renowned hematologist, um, oncologist in Denver, Colorado. And his uncle was General Jimmy Doolittle. And General Do Doolittle was sent over to the European theater in World War II to look into Foo Fighters because these things were zipping around our aircraft, going down the middle of them, materializing, dematerializing, doing all this stuff with our electronics. We didn't understand what this was. Now, initially we thought, the Americans and the, the, the Allied forces thought that it was a German secret weapon. And, but the Germans, we found from intelligence, thought it was a secret Allied weapon. And so President Roosevelt sent General Doolittle over there and said, find out what these are. So he came back to the White House, and I know this because he, he directly told Dr. Altshuler this, his, his nephew, that they were, and, and reported back to FDR, sir, these are interplanetary vehicles. So at that point, it began to be understood that not only were these extraterrestrial, but they were transdimensional. We'll get into this in a moment. And that the technologies behind it are the really high end of electronic uh, vortices that are created that allow an object to go from one point in space to another, materialize, dematerialize. And, but also when it's in this dimension, has all kinds of effects on conventional electronics. Cars stop, magnetic compasses spin, et cetera, and so on. 
So this began to be looked at, and they figured out how to do some countermeasures. And countermeasures are figuring out how, th how to uh, adapt, and this was uh, going on before Roswell. Now, in 1947, the only nuclear bomb squadron in the world was in Roswell, New Mexico, the 508th Bomber Squadron, and no other bomber squadron in the world had atomic weapons on Earth. The Russians didn't have it yet, etc. So this particular system was in a radar dome, and in the FBI memo it says they apparently switched on a new high-powered radar that interfered with the electronics of the navigation of these craft, and they collided. And it's true. We know that three ET craft crashed at Roswell, but the third one wasn't found until, I believe, 1951, early 50s. It, was, it went off and crashed in a very remote area. And the other two, one was blown to smithereens, and one proceeded westward near Socorro and had uh, in, crashed intact and there was one living uh, extraterrestrial biological entity on it, and the others were very badly mangled and died. So that began the whole modern era where they had perfected a way of knocking down these extraterrestrial vehicles that were coming in and around our atomic weapons facilities. And it was no coincidence that that was also within months of when the Air Force split off from the Army Air Force. There was no U.S. Air Force until after Roswell, and when the CIA was formed. I'm going through this history, not to bore you, but so that you have some context to understand that this is 70-some years in the making of covert black projects studying this issue. And the fact that the man on the street doesn't know this, so what? You need to know it, and I'm going to go into 10 times, 100 times more information in these two hours than are in the film, because I'm assuming you know what's in the film. If you didn't see the film, I'm sorry. Now, fast forward into 1950s, and you have a guy named Eisenhower, who's a famous general in World War II, and Eisenhower, uh, after Truman, authorized the continuation of the study of the modus operandi, I'm quoting from a top secret document from Canada, the Wilbur Smith document, on how these craft m operated. And so a very intense, unacknowledged special access project, this is when they really started, in the late 40s and 50s were stood up to acquire the technology and figure out how these things work. By October 1954, we had mastered gravity control, what pop culture would call anti-gravity, which means that everything that we're using on this planet since 1954 has been obsolete since that date. Now, how do I know that? Well, a man who was on my team for years until he passed away of prostate cancer a couple years ago, Rick Foe, she was the uh, highest ranking scientist at the largest Department of Defense lab. And Mr. Foch, um, was a very good friend, stayed at my home, knew his family very well, uh, was very direct in saying that he was in the vault and actually acquired uh, and saw a document that stated that they had mastered gravity control October 1954. Now, <laughs> this is before I was born and I have eight grandchildren. <laughs> Scary thought, me being a granddad. Terrifying. Anyway. I'm a lot of fun, if a little, a little eccentric, but so, and why not? But what ended up happening is that the national security state did not want this out. A, they understood it could be weaponized, and they wanted to weaponize it, turn it into weapons. And B, the energy source, as you heard from people in this film and, and in other testimony, is the zero-point energy field where you could have something that would basically fit on this little stand and it could power, as was said, a, flat, a, a, a wristwatch or an entire city. You could, New York City could be powered off of that. Free energy. And that's not a myth either. But the same oligarchs and sociopaths and fascists who ran the world economy 
in the time of Tesla in the 20s and in the time of uh, T. Townsend Brown in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, who was doing experimentation with voltages and levitation with crystals. You know about those studies. And in the time of Eisenhower in the 50s, those fascists are still here. <laughs> we didn't defeat them. They just went subterranean. All right? So I often say we're really living in the Fourth Reich. And uh, I had an interesting conversation with uh, a man. Is John Warner here? John Warner? Are you here? You're too shy to raise your hand. <laughs> well, if he's not here, hello. Tell him hi. This is Senator John Warner's son. All right. And Senator John Warner, I knew back in the 90s, was a member of the MAGIC Committee, Majority Intelligence Committee, MAJIC, that's been managing the secrecy on this for 70-some years, since Truman. And he says, you know, my, my grandfather, towards the end of his life, who was Paul Mellon, everybody know the Mellon family? Uh, one of the few billionaires on the planet back in those days, now they're a dime a dozen. And what happened is that Paul Mellon told him prior to his death that when World War II ended, they went over and they got from Adolf Hitler's scientists a disc, and there was also a bell, but his, his, his grandfather, Paul Mellon, re was there when they retrieved a flying disc. Now, it wasn't perfected yet, and that was Adolf Hitler's secret weapon, was an anti-gravity electronic disc. We had an atomic bomb. We got the atomic bomb before he got the flying disc. Understand? And therefore, they brought it back in. But he says, look, he says he knew that his family and all those people who went over there were fascists at heart. But prior to the war, they were overtly supportive of Adolf Hitler and fascism, as was the founder of IBM, as was Ford, as was a whole lot of fame, as Prescott Bush, uh, Elder Bush's dad. These were all sympathizers with fascism which is just a matter of historical fact. It's not a political statement. It's a historical fact. Now, those folks didn't go away at the end of World War II. We defe defeated the German army. We did not defeat the ideology and the authoritarianism of fascism. And that is what you need to understand to get your mind around what's been going on for the last 70 years. The pretense that we're living in a free world in a free democracy, when in reality we're, le we're living in the second and third generation of the fascist state that existed during Adolf Hitler's time. Now, what happened when they had an almost perfected Nazi bell and disc, and that research folded into the R&D and reverse engineering of an extraterrestrial vehicle. And they had one, and then they had another, and there were other downings. And I have one man on my team who will not come public because he's in fear of his life was at Fort Huachuca over here in Arizona at an underground facility. This is where Army Intelligence Headquarters is. And there were nine extraterrestrial crafts stored there. And he personally saw the different species and bodies. So and that was back in the 70s when he was there. So this has been going on for 70 years, where we have been deliberately and purposely targeting and downing extraterrestrial craft who have come in moss from multiple civilizations from around the universe when we began detonating atomic weapons. Now, were many of these civilizations aware of Earth prior to that? Yes. Had many of them visited us? Yes, at least like ancient aliens TV show. Much of that is true. Um, in fact, there's a man who works under contract to, at IT&T, but he really works for the CIA. And whenever they find an ancient artifact that's technological, that's hundreds of thousands to several million years old, and they exist, uh, he will study it and, and tell the intelligence community, the IC for short, what that would be used for and how it operated. The guy is a genius. I mean, absolute genius. He's also stayed at my home. So the, what I've found with these sort of gentlemen is that they know a great deal, but they can speak of only so much. And so whatever you see in the Disclosure Project archives 
is less than 1% of what I've gotten briefed on. Um, and I'm going to try to give you the other 99% as much as I can in two hours. Deal? Y'all ready? Yeah. All right. All right. So, <laughs> y'all ready for this? Log, yeah. All right. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to take a, a tour de force through this information so that when you then hear other speakers or hear other information, you can begin to have a scintilla of discernment between is this real or is it Memorex? You understand? Is this, is this something that is man-made, masquerading as ET, or is it actually ET, or is it you don't have enough data to make the determination? What I call the gray area. Well, huh? no pun intended. And uh, <laughs> yes, that's another whole discussion. Um, so when they began to study this from both human experimentation with electromagnetic systems, anti-gravity from the 20s, 30s, 40s, and then that combined and was greatly supplemented, augmented, augmentation was massive from studying the extraterrestrial materiel. That paid off by 1954. And by 1954, guess what? You know, it's like I was a kid born in 1955. I'll be 62 next month. And hard to believe, I was 34 when I started this project, and now I'm kind of an old dude. But what can you do? Uh, time goes on no matter what. I still bench press 410. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> It's how I deal with stress, move weights around. I know it's a very guy thing. So we had this amazing uh, technological transfer that happened. Now we had a chance at peace. And you all heard the rumors that Eisenhower had a meeting out here in the desert of California where Edwards Air Force Base is now, Muroc. That happened. And when I was in the process of putting together the briefing for the Minister of Defense and the President of France back in 07, 08, that period, about 10 years ago, they sent me a report from someone that they had in their archives who had been there with Eisenhower. And what the extraterrestrial civilizations were asking for, and yes, they do work together, uh, they have different specialized functions. We'll get into that maybe tonight uh, or tomorrow night depending on their natural capabilities and interests, uh, like all peoples. But they offered to help our civilization technologically if we would stop this proliferation of hydrogen bombs, thermonuclear weapons. Eisenhower was friendly to this. Uh, others, like Forrestal, were. He got killed. George Patton, by the way, the General Patton, was very supportive of disclosing these uh, technologies to the public after they retrieved them from the Nazis in 1945, and he was assassinated because of that. He was killed because of his support for disclosure. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so this is how... <laughs> this is... We, we went completely off the rails between 1947 and 1955. And we haven't gotten it back in place since. So we're, we're, we're now 60-some years into an unconstitutional, deep government. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is an absolute fact, and we can prove it. That does not answer to the constitutional authorities, whether it's the president or the Congress or even some of their generals and admirals that I have briefed. So these unacknowledged special access projects became more and more and more powerful as they got more and more technology and money and started taking a bigger and bigger and bigger piece of the U.S. budget, but also spun off corporations that then spun off things like integrated circuits and computers and fiber optics and night vision. These all came from studying extraterrestrial materiel items. 
and were highly profitable. Now, never mind that you and me, the taxpayers, paid for all the research and development, and these corporate Nazis, who are psychopaths, took it, monetized it, and it made trillions of dollars. And we're happy to use our iPhone, and we're just clucking along, and ignorant of the fact that this is all stolen technology from we, the people. So, you know, that is what began to happen, and this is why Eisenhower said, beware of the military-industrial complex. And one of the most important, uh, I don't know how if we have some of these clips lined up, but I want to go through just real quickly, because it, it kind of does it in a, in a compact way, the, uh, some clips. And our first one is this one from Eisenhower, and this is what he's talking about. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. Next. Many A shadowy government with its own Air Force, its own Navy, its own fundraising mechanism, and the ability to pursue its own ideas of the national interest, free from all checks and balances, and free from the law itself. This is a senior senator from Hawaii, Inui, talking about the deep national security state on the Senate floor during the Iran-Contra, but he's referring, he has his own funding mechanism, et cetera, and so on. Think about that. It's self-funded, no one is overseeing it, the senators aren't, you aren't, and most certainly the President of the United States isn't. Next. The nations of the world will have to unite, for the next war will be an interplanetary war. The nations of the Earth must someday make a common front against attack by people from other planets. General Douglas MacArthur. Look at the date on that. Okay, the date on that, I was four months old, October 1955, precisely one year after we mastered gravity control. So the warmongers and the war profiteers and the psychopaths who love endless war hatched a plan in the early and mid-50s. And one of the documents we have from Walter Bedell Smith, the CIA director from 1953, talks about the psychological warfare value of the UFO subject. We'll get into that in a moment. Next clip. Sorry. <laughs> it is time for the truth to be brought out. Behind the scenes, high-ranking Air Force officers are soberly concerned about the UFOs. But through official secrecy and ridicule, many citizens are led to believe the unknown flying objects are nonsense. I urge immediate congressional action to reduce the dangers from secrecy about unidentified flying objects. CIA Director, Vice Admiral, Roscoe Hillenkeeter. Pause it. That was the first director of the CIA formed after Roswell. That gentleman in 19, you saw the date, wrote to the Congress and it was published in the New York Times. Around the same time Eisenhower warned of the military industrial complex. And this is a five-star general, you know, and this was an admiral. I mean these are not, you know, it's not Abby Hoffman saying these things, all right, from the 60s or some hippie. These are your key military people warning you. And why he said that at the end, he didn't say the UFOs were a threat to the national security, he said the secrecy is a threat to the national security, just as Eisenhower did. And every single admiral, flag officer, general I have met with, and director of intelligence entities, from the CIA to the DIA to the alphabet soup of things here and abroad, have said, yes, this secrecy is a threat to world security and peace because they have so much power and technology and no one in the system outside these unacknowledged criminal enterprises that are running the secrecy have any control over it. Next clip. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. All right, pause it. 
here we go. Now let me tell you how this came about. One of the men who developed SDI, Star Wars, the Strategic Defense Initiative in its early conceptual days, uh, was a colonel, Holman, and, he, and I talked about this a great deal. And he was on a briefing team that would go in and try to scare the hell out of the U.S. president about the ETs. So some of the presidents have been briefed just enough to secure their cooperation on a, what MacArthur called an interplanetary war, where they want to create a scenario in the future where instead of us fighting you know, a few hundred terrorists in the Middle East, or a few thousand even, and spending a trillion dollars a year on intelligence and defense spending, we can stampede the entire planet into hysteria using psychological warfare and host alien events to have an interplanetary conflict that would enrich the warmongers a thousand times more than the Iraq war did, which was also a fake war, right? There were no weapons of mass destruction there, but it, we killed hundreds of thousands of people marching in there. And Colin Powell was deceived. And if you think people aren't being deceived, think about this. Secretary of State Colin Powell was sent up there by Cheney and his henchmen to tell people as a matter of certainty and fact that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, which he did not have. And Colin Powell had been the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and a four-star general. And he was deceived by these devils in the intelligence community. And it led to a disastrous situation that is getting worse with, of course, now we have ISIS. Because you go in there, we broke it up. This was all by design so that we keep the fire burning. It's like that rock song. Keep the fire burning because how do you justify trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars going into these same war profiteers and warmongers unless you have an enemy? But we're running out of substantially large enough enemies to feed the monster and the beast. So the big one is coming. Let's continue. When Von Braun was dying in front of me, the very first day that I met him, he had tubes draining out of his side. And he was tapping on the desk telling me, you will come to Fairchild. I was a school teacher. You will come to Fairchild and you will be responsible for keeping weapons out of space. The strategy that Werner von Braun taught me was that first the Russians were the enemy against whom we're going to build space-based weapons. Then terrorists would be identified. Then we were going to identify third world country crazies. And the next enemy was asteroids. The last card is the alien card. And all of it, he said, is a lie. A lie. <laughs> Love her. Here's the truth that people don't want to hear. Now, she didn't know this. Carol didn't know this. In fact, just, she just called me just before I got on stage. Um, by the 1950s and 60s, because we had man-made UFOs, they were able to do things that looked alien and to 99.9999999% of the population would be, including the president, but were actually being done by the intelligence community and these unacknowledged special access projects, USAP, super secret projects. And these include, but are not limited to, the following. UFO events, UFO crashes, we'll get to this in a moment, the abduction of humans with people and then entities that were man-made, that look alien, and the use of electronic warfare systems to simulate those experiences, as well as certain chemical weapons uh, and hallucinogens. Now, how many people here have heard of MK Ultra, the 50s, 60s, you know, giving acid to people? What they didn't tell you during the Senator Church's hearing is that the crown jewel of the mind control projects of the 1950s and 60s and 70s was not chemical or LSD or hallucinogens. It was electronics. 
So here's something that I'm going to tell you that I learned in 1993 or 4 by the man who invented it. A uh, man who invented an electronic system that interfaced directly with consciousness. It was used both actively and passively. In other words, you could put this on and it would enable the person, no matter how skilled or unskilled, to remote view with consciousness at a different point in space or time. This was 1956. 56. But it can also be used to give people experiences which are completely hallucinogenic, but which come across as incredibly real. He said to me, and I later had this confirmed by many different scientists who work for E-Systems and Raytheon and a whole you know, plethora of, of intelligence community contractors, so that they could give you an experience. It'd be like uh, virtual reality, but on steroids, where you would have the ability to have uh, someone have this experience and it is so real because it's in consciousness that it's being done. It's in their mind. And it can be done remotely and targeted remotely. And those people, and this is what this gentleman, and I'm quoting, he says, if we want you to have a personal conversation with your personal God, Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, whoever, you'll have it, you'll pass a lie detector test that it's real, it is that good. Now, fast forward to a few years ago, I'm on one of these expeditions, we lead out under the stars, and a woman comes who used to work for one of these companies, and he, she said, yes, and we could sit in a room with a console, turn a dial, target the board of directors of a corporation, and if we wanted them to come agreement on something we wanted them to come to agreement on, we could turn the dial and there would be complete harmony. We can turn the dial the other way, and they'd all be fighting. It's absolutely. So when were you working that project? She said in the mid-70s. This is what Werner von Braun, it's not in this clip, warned about more than even the risk of interplanetary war, which psychopaths... And the people who tried to stop it, George S. Patton, killed. Forrestal, murdered. JFK, dead. Marilyn Monroe was going to just blow the whistle because she didn't know what she was stepping into. Whacked. So, you know, if you don't go along with the agenda, it's very dangerous, no matter who you are. Bill Colby, the CIA director for Ford, President Ford, trying to help us bring out free energy, the week he's going to meet with the, my, a member of my board of directors, they find him floating down the Potomac River killed, although his family thinks he either had an accident or was a suicide. It was neither. His best friend, a colonel, retired colonel, told me specifically that Bill Colby was assassinated because he was going off the reservation of the secrecy and trying to move disclosure forward, but most importantly, bring the technology out before both polar ice caps melt and 70% of the population is underwater. And that's coming, if we're not careful. So that is the kind of thing that... Now, this is what I deal with day in and day out, all right? This is, this is what became my life. This is why I left medicine. I realized the war... I'm an emergency doctor, and I always tell people, I know a goddamn emergency when I see one. <laughs> <laughs> and we are in an emergency. Now... The interstellar civilizations know we're in an emergency, too. The big red flag that went over Earth when we had detonated atomic weapons said, wow, these folks have so much beauty and promise, but there's an aspect of them that's gone so out of control that now they have technologies that could destroy all life on Earth and could become an existential threat to other planets because we're starting to go into space. This began the modern UFO era. So I always tell people, all these people running around afraid of the aliens, and this intelligence guy and military guy who went to Ronald Reagan said, and he told me it was a hoax, he said, yes, there, you're right, there, there are ETs out there, 
they're a threat to us and we need to put weapons in space and we need SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative. And that is what brainwashed Reagan into making that comment at the United Nations and then brainwashed him into billions and billions and billions of dollars into uh, brilliant pebbles and all kinds of other stuff that's just nonsense that never worked so that they could take that money, use 10% of it on the stated project, like Brilliant Pebbles, and put the other 90% into black projects weaponizing space. That's how it works. That's how the defense industry works. So unfortunately, Reagan did not have the discernment you're going to have by the end of this two-hour meeting. And it cost us a great deal. Um, and so he was played like a fiddle, sort of the Independence Day scenario. You know, the movie Independence Day with Will Smith, let's go kick alien butt! <laughs> you know, all that jingoism and bullshit. And here's why it's nonsense. Because if you are in the interstellar civilization and you wanted to just take care of the Earth problem, it'd take you one nanosecond. It's point, set, match, over. Now we're going to go through in a little while what transdimensional interstellar technologies are. So you have a little understanding of why these scenarios that are being presented about this, this race and that race are out there and it's the movie Star Wars. Well, this is great for Hollywood and George Lucas. And it sells billions of dollars worth of movies and seminars and space on Gaia TV. However, it is absolutely dangerous. And here it's why it's dangerous. Because when we start going down that path of a narrative of hate and what I call alienism, what's alienism? It's like racism, but you're, it's humans against another species instead of black against white or Shia against Sunni or one ethnic tribe against another or one economic system against another. This is the big one that they want to play because the demagogues who are counting on endless war need your cooperation and need to have you brainwashed that there's an enemy that you should be afraid of and hate to support the next big war. And that's just a fact. Next clip. Air Force Intelligence. Yeah, the high level producers and directors. Yeah. And were they, how were they paid so that it wasn't? Cash. <laughs> yeah, you pay. What you do is you make them sign a form and you tell them, you got to report this to the IRS. But whether they do it or not, you, you know, you're, you're not going to give your form to IRS. I paid, I paid, uh, I better not say. There were, some of them are large. Next. This is buying off the media. The same thing happens with... We did do that, yes. Uh, OSI did that. There was a special group uh, out of uh, the 7602nd Air Intel Wing at Fort Belvoir. They came out and did that. They uh, had these uh, people that had maybe some sort of defects. Uh, Antonomical defects that were uh, brought brought in to to, to to fool people into thinking they're aliens. Yeah, um, I can't give you any specifics because it's still the program is still classified, and they probably still doing it. I wouldn't doubt doubt it. They were still doing it. So they've already got this psychological okay. warfare. So let's pause it. Bang. Now this guy was a professional disinformation counterintelligence officer. I did a three-hour interview with him. It's in the movie Unacknowledged. He comes clean because I knew what to ask. So I asked him about the false flag, and I asked him about the intelligence community and military being involved in abductions, and he confirms it. But he also says, listen carefully, I can't go into that too much. That's still probably still going on, and it is. It absolutely is. Now, does this mean that everyone who's had contact with an ET has been done? No, it doesn't. It means that they want it to be so confused that you can't discern which is real contact and which is man-made. And the man-made ones are designed to be terrifying. Now, 
I want to go back to Dr. Altshuler, who was the only real solid scientist doing work on mutilations, cattle, horse. He did the Snippy the Horse case back in the 67 or whenever it was in Colorado. And he concluded that these were all being done by paramilitary humans made to look like UFOs. Now, when that was how it went on, we already had man-made UFOs going around doing stuff. They were testing out systems. And people say, oh, well, the cut was so precise it couldn't have been done without you know, some alien technology. Well, it wouldn't have been done with technologies that were in your local hospital in 1960 or 70 or 80. But in a classified project, they have it. You think that classified projects don't have things reaching parity with what ETs have? They have. So those events started happening. And I, by chance, when I was learning this from Dr. Altshuler, and he says, oh, yeah, he says, it's really too bad because my work has been taken by people who have been, are then saying, you know, all of this is being done by aliens. And this book, you know, an, al uh, you know, an alien harvest and this and that. And he said, no. We knew, all of us knew, that those were paramilitary operations, not ET. Again, for their psychological warfare value. And they were getting raw materials they were using in their underground bases for biological experiments I'll get into in a moment if you really want to hear some Frankenstein stuff. Now, is this too creepy? No? I don't know how far to go sometimes, people. <laughs> So let, okay, we'll keep going then. So, you know, I tell you, the truth is going to piss you off before it's going to... Yeah, so this is, this is what you need to know if you're going to be an interplanetary ambassador tomorrow night. These technologies have been very well developed and were operational when I was a child. Now, when you have an Air Force intelligence guy admit this, and also you have people coming forward like Ben Rich, who is the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works. In the film Unacknowledged, we have in his handwriting and a letter between he and a close friend, and he affirms that, yes, there are man-made UFOs and there are ET ones. This is the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, the super-secret Skunk Works. And the Cube, which is the state-of-the-art facility underground near Edwards, where these operations are ongoing, I know a engineers work there. These technologies are so beyond what you can imagine. Anything you can imagine in a Star Trek movie or science fiction, they've already done in these, in these laboratories. So we have to begin to understand the extent to which there's the technology that you read about on CNN and in you know tech journals and it comes out of Google or iPhones and what have you. And then there's the real high-tech stuff that is in the unacknowledged world. And you have to understand those technologies to understand what people call the alien phenomenon. Because 90% of it is man-made, masquerading as ET because they want people to have a new enemy to hate. So that begins to elucidate some other key points. Let's listen to Michael Stratt, who's a great researcher on covert military aircraft, anti-grabs. ...into the minds of people to expect an extraterrestrial, not a secret aircraft, but an alien craft. So when they do pull this, they'll already have everything ready to roll. Uh, these civilians got onto the base uh, and, and got into something, and they... they uh, they saw something they weren't supposed to see, and this group came out and went into their home and scared the dickens out of them. And staged an alien yeah, event. Exactly. I said staged an alien event. He said exactly. That's happened thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Now, you can't if you weren't discerning and didn't have this. In, now, this has taken me 27 years to find these sources and methods and do this research. You ignore it at your peril. You will ignore this information at your peril because you will be deceived again. Remember the Who song, we won't, be deceived, we won't be fooled again? We have been. Vietnam, Gulf of Tonkin. Iraq War, bang. This is the big one coming. Now, when Vernon Von Braun was dying, that's why he wanted 
Carol Rosin to, to warn the planet that this was all going to be hoaxed. But it was hatched in the 50s, and the technological foundation for it was hatched in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, electronically and with anti-grabs. Now, is this to say that nothing going on out there or any events that people have with beings are real ET? No, there are a lot of real ET events. But you, if you don't know the distinction between one and the other, you're going to slam them all together. And the best disinformation is coded in information that's true. And at the core of it is that poison pill. And what I would suggest to you, and the reason I made this film, is that I got a heads up that that agenda was being fast-tracked in the last year or two. Because suddenly you had Hillary talking about this stuff. John Podesta, the WikiLeaks hack with the, the emails, some of which mentioned me and, and Edgar Mitchell. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of this, unless you don't read. And that's a good possibility nowadays. Uh, um, read. Learn to read. Uh, and so what has happened is we have a tremendous amount of evidence from, from in my network that they've started launching various disinformation vectors. So I'll give you an example. There's a young rock artist who I introduced to this. He stayed at my home named Tom DeLong, Blink-182. And um, he then got targeted by a guy at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, General McCaskill, feeding him disinformation about how courageous it is for us to fight the aliens. And it was like right out of MacArthur's mouth in 1955. And he's creating information that he sincerely thinks is real that is completely counterintelligence disinformation to prepare the millennials and the X generation people for interplanetary war because they're trying to pull another generation along. Does this make sense to you? I'm afraid to tell you that the same is happening with the most of the information from Bill Tompkin. The frightening part of the information from MK Ultra Babies, everybody know what MK Ultra Babies are? Oh, well, Dr. Fred Bell was an MK Ultra Baby, and I used to stay at his home. He's Dr. B in the disclosure book for all of you who've read and memorized that, which I'm sure you all have. Um, and those kids were handed off at a very young age, some as infants, by their parents. And, and Dr. Bell was a uh, direct descendant of Alexander Graham Bell, had a very high IQ, great technical capabilities in electromagnetism. The agency, the CIA, wanted him. The parents agreed to hand them over to the MK Ultra program. And so he was brought along in 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s into this system. I was at his house and actually saw his badges and, and credentials for all the companies he worked for, Hughes Aerospace, all these big, everything. And yet, he had a lot of experiences that he thought were real that were the result of what I described a little while ago, that were electronic warfare systems that gave him virtual reality consciousness-based experiences so that he would hate the aliens and develop weapons to shoot them down. And so he developed them. He says, yes, in 1965, we had a platform up there, and when a ET craft would materialize into this dimension, we could target it, hit it, and it dropped down like a lead weight into the Pacific Ocean, and we'd all be going, yay, we killed another one. Now, this has been going on since I was a child. You should all be terrified of this nonsense. So some of, this, some of the folks, uh, you know, I, I don't know Corey Good. I know that some of his information, he's on the page with disclosing, but some of the stuff that he's recounting, remembering, Corey, those were programmed events in virtual reality. Now, have I had an experience with this? Yeah. So let me tell you my own experience, if you want to hear it. It ain't pretty. 1994, July. I'm back and forth with Prince Hans Adam von Liechtenstein, the crown prince of Liechtenstein, which, as you all know, is one of the chief funders of Adolf Hitler. And he was an Opus Dei, um, the chief funder of Opus Dei, the far right-wing um, radical group at the Vatican. 
and Pope John Paul would you know, come to his castle in Liechtenstein and hold private masses for him and everything. So he flies over to New York, and he's going to be meeting with some folks that I'm working with there back in 94. Um, and I agree to meet with him. He, he was very cryptic. Um, I got a, a message that he wanted me to call him, so I called him at his castle. And uh, someone picked up, and as soon as I said who I, I said, this is Dr. Greer calling for uh, uh, his highness. And they immediately put on uh, the crown prince. They don't have a king, so this crown prince. And uh, he said, I, look, I, I can't talk with you on the phone about what I want to share, but we need to meet. I said, sure. So we had to deconflict our schedules. Uh, eventually, we met in New York. Um, and he was staying at the Pierre Four Seasons Hotel on uh, Fifth Avenue there at Central Park. And I decided to go up with my little daughter. And I, my daughter, I have four daughters, and I was doing so much shuttle diplomacy trying to get the Clintons and other people to get on board to disclose this, and the military and the, the people in Australia and the UK that I started doing a date with daddy. And a date with daddy would be one child at a time could come with me on a meeting once they got to be eight or nine years old. So, so because then I could, you know, they were more easily manageable because I couldn't, you know, be meeting with a head of state and have a two-year-old in the room. So, um, so she came. And we're there meeting with him, my little daughter, who's eight or nine, just before she turned nine. And... He starts telling me this story about how much support he was, money he was pouring into the abduction groups and mutilation groups through cutouts. And he specifically named uh, Bud Hopkins, and Jacobs, Mac, uh, and others. But he says, I've stopped funding John Mac because he's not as negative as I want him to be. And I said, and I was just listening. I said, well, tell me, what is the purpose behind this? He said, well, we want the people to hate the aliens enough that we'll have an interplanetary war so that Christ will return. Now, I'm just telling you, this is what he said. And I'm just listening because, you know, a good doctor listens to and that, you know, 90% of diagnosis is just listening to the patient if you know how to listen and, and ask the right questions. That's really true. I mean, forget the CAT scan. You just know it if you just let them talk. So, <laughs> so I let him talk, and I'm just going, holy crap, this is batshit crazy, dude. But I, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking this. I mean, you know, okay, so this is 23 years ago this summer. And then... Uh, we talk about some other things, like the fact that the Secretary General of the United Nations, Paris de Cuellar, had been abducted. Now, in his defense, he had been a target of disinformation and had his brother abducted by covert forces out of the castle. So he was targeted. A lot of these leaders have had their family members targeted with military intelligence abductions like this gentleman is describing so that they would go along with the agenda of endless war that's interplanetary. You see how psychological manipulative that is. So he jumped on board this whole mutilation abduction thing and was pouring money in it like you don't know. Now, I asked him what happened to Paris de Quare? He says, well, there was a meeting at the uh, UN back in his motorcade, and he was abducted out of his motorcade at 3 in the morning. And I knew about this already. This is the famous Bud Hopkins case of a famous world leader who was taken out of the motorcade. You know the story. Well, it was Paris de Cuellar. And I said, how do you know that? He says, I'm personal friends with Paris de Cuellar. So I, I just let him talk. I said, well, tell me what actually happened. He says, well, he was taken on board this craft, and the really scary alien said, if you don't stop the program that you're involved with, with George Bush Sr., the then President of the United States, and other world leaders to end secrecy and disclose this subject, the aliens said to Paris de Cuellar, we will abduct every world leader involved, and that includes the President of the United States. He was then put back in his car, 
terrified and went back to his home there at Sutton Place. Now, I knew Boutrous Boutrous Ghali and his wife, the Secretary General after that. Um, and what it turned out to be is that, you remember the Roswell case where the red-headed sergeant who said, I'm going to leave bones scattered in the desert, they won't even find your bones if you don't keep your mouth shut about this. His son became in his father's footsteps and was in the security detail who arranged the electronics for this abduction of Paris de Cuellar from the motorcade. Now, how did that happen in Manhattan? How much do you want to know about electronics that do this? This, is, this gets into the deep, 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 deep end of the pond. Okay, so I said, well, I said, with all due respects, I don't think that's what happened, and I think it's more complex than that. And we talked about the CE5 initiative, the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind initiative, where we make contact with these civilizations for peace. Um, and he says, you know, because he has a private jet, he says, I go all over the world where there's a wave of these sightings, and wherever I go, there are sightings before I'm there. But while I'm there, no UFOs, or there, no ET craft are there at all. I wonder if it's my attitude. I said, with, with all due respect, Your Highness, I think you hit the nail on the head. Because he was so populated with fear and hatred. The ETs don't want to interact with someone like that. Why should they? <laughs> they want to do that. They can deal with the psychopaths who run unacknowledged special access projects. They're not interested in them either. Now, that night, I'm in my bedroom at the St. Moritz Hotel on Central Park South. And I'm there going to sleep. Suddenly, a beam, a, a, it was like an energy force, it wasn't visible light, came into the room and tried to abduct me. I could tell it was electronic and it was directional, and I could tell, and, but the, sh the, the, the energy it had was sheer, terrifying, I mean, stark raving evil. And I knew it was coming from a man-made source because I was astute enough to know about this. So what I did, they, they were trying to abduct me to say, ah, you don't believe that's what happened to Paris de Cuellar? We're going to do it to you right down the street where you're staying. And so I was hit with this weapon system. It was crystal clear, more real than sitting here today. And so what I did to stop it is that I transcended. Luckily, I was a medita meditator, and I had been a meditation teacher before I was a medical doctor. And so I started doing a meditation and a prayer, and I transcended into the ocean of unbounded mind so that my drop became the ocean. And they can't take the ocean. They can only take the drop. Get it? So it's transcendence. So when I transcended into that, if you want to call it cosmic consciousness state, and with the power of that unbounded mind and, and purity of that, then it stopped. But then as soon as I came back into my individual ego self, hit again, and again, and again, and again. It was very exhausting. But they never got me. <laughs> they almost got me. But they didn't quite get me. Now, this was an electronic warfare system. And they were trying to say, all right, we're going to teach you. I came back from that not fooled, but actually what they had done by doing this to me personally is that they tipped their hand. And I saw through it as crystal clear what they were doing. So what happens then? Every night at 4.20 a.m. or so, for about a month or two, there would be a subaudible click I would hear in my room. It would wake me up. And I would be hit with a weapon system that made me so sick, I had to literally crawl on my hands and knees to get to the bathroom even stand up and it would last for about 10 or 15 minutes and then it would pass. Now, I wasn't sick from anything man-made except an electronic weapon system. This happened every night over and over and over. It was torture. So my wife of course knew this was going on. That's when I was going to close down everything I was doing in 1994. But I'm stubborn so I didn't. <laughs> but that's the kind of stuff they can throw at you. And I knew this was man-made. And then I, because I had already been briefed by men who had worked those weapon systems that are electronic, psychotronic, radionic type things. 
Now, all that information sounds disparate to you. Like, what the hell is this guy talking about now? But what I'm saying is, combine all those capabilities and throw in a big measure of biologicals. So we've talked about electronics. Now let's talk about biologicals. You think that Dolly the sheep was the first cloned creature in Scotland? No, ma'am. No, sir. There have been technologies cloning human-like creatures since long before that, because it's all based in electromagnetic pulses that can cause a cloning effect. So a lot of these creatures that we see running around, and we've had a few of them that have tried to infiltrate our expeditions, we know exactly what it is, are actually man-made biologicals, and some have called these program life forms. But they have integrated circuits in their neural cortex, but they're biological. They're basically biological robots that are man-made. So there's a facility in Australia that makes them. I know a couple people who worked in that facility out in Pine Gap. There are a deep underground bases that are connected to Los Alamos that travel out to the Dulce area. Above the ground at Dulce, there's nothing. You can only get there through an underground connector. That's a biological lab. And those have been used as they become more and more sophisticated in conjunction with what he just described. When we want to scare someone and make them think what they saw was alien, we send in one of these squads. That's what he said. Did you listen carefully? Now, his whole interview, three hours, we're putting out as a special feature on iTunes. And it's also on DVD, so you should see it. And then my whole interview that was the foundation of this movie is also available about three hours, I guess. I think that what people have to begin to connect some dots here. When you have the intent to do what Douglas, Douglas MacArthur said, World War III will be interplanetary, and you have people warning, like the first CI director, of the danger the secrecy has become to the national security. And I would say, to, is there a secret space program? Yes. Is it what you've been told? No. There's no, you know, groups of spacecraft going all out throughout the cosmos in a sort of battle galactica thing going on. We would like to. And it's been done in conscious virtual reality. Do you know why the Nellis Air Force area, the specific area, was called Dreamland? Because when you go into those simulators, how many of you have had an, a, a lucid astral dream, like an out-of-body dream? They have technologies that will enable you to go into that state and in that state go out there. But you're not out there in your physical body in a physical spacecraft. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that can be a programmed virtual reality experience or you can do it in reality and see what's really out there. And there are people who have been allowed to go and see what's really out there that they then piggyback and dovetail in the other program, the virtual reality fake one. Does this make sense? And those people do not know where the fake one starts and the real one ended. This is really d difficult because Dr. Bell admitted to me that his mind was so scrambled that he didn't know what part of what he remembered was real versus programmed through these consciousness interfacing electromagnetic war systems. I know a number of people are getting upset by hearing this. And I'm, I, I apologize for this planet. Therefore, this is a, an emergency. I'm sort of the cosmic Paul Revere here saying, there's a real problem with this tidal wave of uh, information mixed with disinformation. So there's information that's legitimate, but in the core of it are very frightening scenarios that have been embedded in these people who have been victims of MK Ultra and have been creating Manchurian candidates and who have uh, put this information out there and I think what we have to begin to ask is, even if all of that were literally true and not a virtual reality consciousness program, what's our response to that? What, 
What should we do? Well, you have two choices. You can be like Will Smith in Independence Day and go kick alien butt. Good luck with that. Or we can choose to engage in dialogue with these civilizations, realizing that there is actually one conscious mind within all of us and find the foundation for universal peace where we can go forward as a peaceful planet. That's the choice. It is really that stark. Now, uh, people like to be scared. People like to have someone to hate. You know, and this is what I said. There's this new thing. You know, it's not politically correct to be an overt racist. You, you can talk in dog whistles and code words, I guess, and get elected. Um, it's not politically correct to be blatantly homophobic or blatantly misogynist, but it's okay to be blatantly alienist, where it's this alienism. And you'll notice that the, the, the good ETs always look like, what the, uh, Tompkin was talking about, this blonde, buxom, gorgeous, Nordic looking with the big boobs. <laughs> Wonderful. And of course, the evil ones look different from us. They're playing on the racist foundation of conflict that humans have been dealing with for thousands of years. This is demagoguery. And they're very good at it. They have kept one religion against another, one race against another, one people against another, going in conflict for thousands of years. It's been the organizing principle of our civilization has been division and war. Now, we come by it naturally because chimpanzees and monkeys organize into troops like that. But we have to transcend that part of ourselves and find a higher spiritual aspect of ourselves that realizes that we are one people in one universe and we have to live together in peace. Because the alternative is termination. Why do I say that? Well, by the 1950s, something came along called mutual assured destruction. Everybody heard this term? It means that if one nuclear weapon is launched, everyone launches everything, and the Earth becomes this radioactive pile of glowing rubble. And that was the deterrent that kept us from actually launching nuclear weapons against the Soviet Union or China or whoever. But here's, that's, a, that's an atomic or a hydrogen bomb, a thermonuclear weapon. What if you're dealing with a civilization that has technologies 100,000 to a million to, in the case of a few of them, one or two billion years ahead of where we are? You think you're going to weaponize that science and technology and engage in hostility and aggression and survive it for more than a nanosecond? No. And so anyone who knows anything, the scientists I know in the classified projects who see all the stuff going on at UFO events like this, laughing out, they're just laughing out loud. Because the fear and the fear mongering, it's like if you know anything about genetics, electromagnetism, interstellar travel, transdimensional physics, the whole thing becomes ludicrous. But it's an, if you put it out there and people latch onto it because we want to have a new enemy to hate. Now, I've been a, you know, I grew up in the South where my, you know, I was almost murdered because I had an African American girlfriend in North Carolina in, in the early 70s. It's like the movie Loving. Did you see the movie Loving? Great movie. And, you know, that's changed. I don't think you get run over by a car like I almost was, with people hanging out the window screaming in lover at me as I'm bicycling to school as a high school boy. But you might in some places, but generally no. We've made progress in some of these areas. But what the demagogues who want to have centralized power over the world, whether it be political or religious, want is to have an entirely new generation of people who have something new to hate. So you have to understand that agenda is the central operating system that evolved in the 1953 era when the CIA director 
Bedell Smith, Walter Bedell Smith said, wouldn't our jo you know, let's, let's use this for a psychological warfare value. And then all those years later, President Reagan at the UN saying, wouldn't our job of creating world unity be easier if we had a common alien threat to unite against? To which I say, why do we have to have someone else to hate to become peaceful and united on Earth? This isn't going forward. This is going way backwards. But it works for the people who want to maintain centralized, fascist, authoritarian power. And this chief vector of this disinformation, unfortunately, has become the UFO subculture. Now, I don't say that with pride. I just say it as a matter of a, a fact. And I think what we have to do is say, what are we going to do as a people to fix this? You're not going to fix it down the laser barrel or an atomic weapon or a scalar weapon or going, you know, cowboys and Indians in space. You're going to do it by understanding what part of the database out there has been of hating somebody that's different, who looks very different from us. And what part of it is being, is real? That's an actual extraterrestrial encounter. And what part of it are things maybe we just don't understand? To wit. I'll give you one great example. I learned some years ago that through Operation Red Light, you know that Operation Red Light that one of our disclosure witnesses talks about. Well, anyway, they, they had an ET communication device that they were studying that enabled them to sort of sense things in the past or future using non-local physics. And it's electromagnet systems, but it, it, it enables to go. Now, the future, you can only talk about a possible or probable future. It may be 95 now. Got it? This is why predictive people who always say on this particular date this will happen, they're always wrong because by the time they say it, enough things change that alter it. Right? You understand this? It's the nature of space, time, and consciousness. There's another whole discussion. We'll get into that uh, Sunday night. But the point I'm making is that they developed these systems so that they could peer and, <laughs> and they realized that ETs could see various possible or probable outcomes. One of them is like the Hopi prophecy, where there's a terminal line. But there's another Hopi prophecy, where we go off and up and out. You know the Hopi rock, the prophecy, from Native American. Um, and the ETs know that. But in, in, as a preparation for not having the best outcome happen, but having a catastrophe happen, they began to do what I call a cosmic Noah's Ark. Now, what do I mean by that? It's the, you, you've heard of the, in Norway, the seed bank that has all the seeds of everything. And then, well, imagine a civiliz multiple civilizations realizing that we were in a position to, to destroy all life on Earth, including human species, where they began to document the biosphere and the genome of the entire planet as a backup in case it crashes. So a lot of the phenomenon you see, now people would say, I could never figure out, you know, the very famous Provence case in France that the Japan group, the, the division of their equivalent of NASA did this report of this spacecraft landed in a, in a lavender field and this man comes out in the wee hours of the night or morning and in the dark, and there are these little ETs that are gathering, picking lavender and taking samples of lavender and taking it on the craft. And there's physical evidence of this landing. It's a great case. It's in our materials. Now, why is that? Well, there, it turns out all over the world, in the waters, in ponds, in the oceans, underwater, every kind of species, they've been taking samples. And they're studying two things. One, they're cataloging the genome, including ours. Number two, 
they're also cataloging the delta, the rate of decay of the genetic material due to chemicals, radiation, poisons. Wonder why we have so much cancer? Treatments are, quote, better, but the rate of cancer keeps going up and up and up and up and up. We're living in a slurry of chemical and petrochemical and radioactive toxic toxicity, which damages cell division, mitosis, and genetics, where you get terrible cancers, but also can result in infertility and the loss of entire species. On top of it, human activity on the planet is entered into a phase that even mainstream scientists are calling this the big extinction. Because since the dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago, we are right now, today, have more species becoming extinct than there has ever been since the dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago. And it's man-made. It's due to how we're living on this earth in a ravenous, destructive way. And the ETs see this madness, and they're trying to study it and account for it, and if necessary, intervene, but in a way that wouldn't be terrifying. And also, in a worst-case scenario, intervene massively. All right? So there is the possibility of a massive intervention if we are foolish enough to let this go on too long. And let's hope that doesn't happen, but there's a backup plan. So the ETs are here. What they want from us is to go, as Michikaku would say, from a zero civilization, level zero, to a level one. A level one civilization is peaceful, not warring, and is no longer destroying its biosphere for its civilization to be high tech. Now, it turns out, 100 years ago, we had that ability. With Tesla-type free energy, et cetera, and so on. The League of Nations, 100 years ago, was subverted. The uh, entire uh, ec ecological mess we're in could have been avoided. But it's not their place to land here and force that on us. It's for us to figure this out so the people can do it. If, if you guys go out and organize contact teams in your communities using the principles of the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind Initiative, higher states of consciousness, and everything I'm going to teach Sunday night, you will be able to create a morphogenic field in consciousness and in the body politic and in culture that shifts the and say, everyone, you guys need to see this movie and understand what the foundation is and also understand what the disinformation is and what that agenda is for the false flag operation, hoaxing events, and what have you. So let, let's see, there's another clip, I think. Oh, is this, this was the next one. Yeah, okay. okay. Have you been exposed or did you come across in, in your career and your network um, the, the false INW or, or the deceptive indication and warnings projects related to this? Yes. And what did you find out about those? Um... That's pretty common in the intelligence community to set up a false flag. And he acknowledges, oh, yes, that exists, but I can't, that's really secret. That's really secret. He just, he was, he's backing off like this. It's more powerful than anyone could possibly say if you look at his body language. Now, the reason that I began briefing the Defense Intelligence Agency director, the three star, and the admiral in charge of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff and CI director and all these people because I learned of this false flag operation 20 some years ago and realized that the people, there are a handful of people in these unacknowledged special access projects who know about it and the rest do not. But by disclosing this information, we can neutralize it being played out. You know what I'm saying? What if people had known for a fact that they were going to hoax the Gulf of Tonkin incident. And we wouldn't have gone into Vietnam the way we did and expanded it. What if people had known for a fact that they were hoaxing stuff for the Iraq war 
And the, pu the public and the con everyone would have said, said, no, we're not going to go marching in there. They weren't behind 9-11, and they also weren't, weren't, don't have any of these weapons, even though if he is a brutal and misguided dictator, but those are all over the world. You're going to march in everywhere? No, we went in because it's the second largest oil field in the world, and we wanted to take that oil off. It would go up to $150 a barrel. Durr, you know, I mean, hello. I mean, it's a Cheney Halliburton move. So... That's what you need to understand is this manipulation. But the manipulation that got us into Vietnam and into the Iraq War and the Mideast imbroglio is nothing compared to the crown jewel of deceptive indications and warnings. And he's affirming it exists, but he's, the, the terror in his eye. I was in the room, the director, Michael Mazzola, he's here. Stand up, Michael, where are you? Is there, are you hiding? Oh, he just went out. He's probably doing something outside. So that's, that's what you all need to understand, is that th this is... Now, if I had had one person confirm this to me, I'd say, ah. But I've had dozens and dozens and dozens. It's very hard to get anyone to go on the record. And we did. I, I don't Did know you ever meet an uh, Air Force pilot who piloted them? Only the, one, only the Cash Landrum. Mm -hmm. I actually interviewed him. Oh, yeah. The pilots, there was a... Um, off the equipment, and then there was a... Uh, I can't remember what the fourth person did. He was in... And everything that could have gone wrong, it took off fine from Nevada and flew perfectly. But when they, it was it was going to um, an air base. I can't remember which air base it was. Some some air base in Texas. I think it was Webb Air Force Base in Big Springs. I think it was. Talking about the cash yeah, land. Pretty sure it was crash. Webb. And when they tried to slow it down, that's when the problems happened. And then they cut power and. So many things went wrong that uh, they almost crashed. In a man-made nuclear power plant, it, it malfunctioned. There was a filter problem, they had a core breach, and it started spewing radioactivity out. And as it went down over outside Houston, it sprayed Cash, Landrum, uh, and these other, several other people with this toxic slurry of highly radioactive waste who were hospitalized and were very sick and virtually killed them. And I think they eventually did die. And he's admitting with humans, craft, and it was, he described the helicopters escorting it as it went down, which is also in all the eyewitness accounts. Now, Cash Landrum tried to sue the U.S. government for injuries, and they said, no such project exists, unacknowledged unacknowledged, but that is a $10 billion lawsuit, and I've just had an attorney contact me who does constitutional law. We might pursue the U.S. government for this because this isn't the only event that's happened where people have been injured and victimized by U.S. covert programs dealing with man-made or man human-piloted UFOs that have caused death and injury. And they always deny it. And they're happy for you guys to believe it was those horrible ETs that did it. He was the principal investigator at the Air Force Office of Special Investigations who debriefed the pilot and the crew. And he says that. Now, w many of us knew that that was a man-made mission all along. Something like this and let the public believe that it was ET or some... Uh, you know, unexplained aerial phenomenon, you know, like the UAP thing that, you know, Hillary said on Jimmy Kimmel. What nonsense. Uh, no, we can't continue to be fooled. And if we are fooled, we're the, they could then launch a fleet of man-made UFOs out of the dry lake beds and the, the lakes that the holding pools, and they, you know, three, four, five in the morning, they come up out of here out of... Uh, uh, near Edwards Air Force Base. And they could launch these from Antarctica, Australia, outback, everywhere, and do something where they blow up a city or do something like this to their own opinion, but not their own set of facts. 
These are the facts. And the facts lead you to an inescapable conclusion. And that is that we are being played like a fiddle and manipulated into hate and fear with, with scenarios that are not true in terms of being ET, but are true in terms of being man-made. And there are people who are purveying that information who absolutely believe what they're saying. I don't, I'm not at all saying there's any disingenuous lying going on. I'm saying that they have themselves been victims of being a vector, a pass-through to the public of this kind of disinformation, the way General McCaskill at Wright-Patterson used Tom DeLong. We have to be careful. And I have to say that the most complex, I mean, I'm an emergency doctor. And I, you know, the differential diagnosis that you've got to have in your random access memory in your brain to take care of people in that setting is a lot. And this is taxing. This is like playing chess in 38 dimensions. Um, but it, it, which is why I often don't talk about all of this, but I feel like the, the movie and the book, the book goes into this in more depth. But what I'm trying to do is give people a foundation so they have discernment. But I'm also trying to expose the criminality of these unacknowledged special access projects and how easily they have infiltrated the New Age subculture, the UFO subculture, and the general populace itself through movies. Like there's, I think today is the next alien movie coming out, you know? So there's billions and billions and billions of dollars going into movies like Independence Day and their sequels and Alien and their sequels were a long way from Close Encounters of the Third Kind in the movie E.T. And the populace is being brainwashed to be prepared for something that is getting fast-tracked. And I think the only way, the reason all of you need to be ambassadors for that is that this is the tool to educate your neighbors and friends who are skeptics or on the fence or don't understand. That's what Michael Mazzola and Stephen Peake and I did when we made this movie. Was it to be something you could give to anyone They go, wow, there's really something here. I didn't know there was this much evidence or material or documents or what have you. And also the narrative of what the evidence is, how they've kept it secret through unacknowledged projects that are illegal, and why. What's the agenda? They want to keep us slaves to the macroeconomic order with a few oligarchs running the central uh, economy and the central power system and utilities and oil and gas and coal. And they want to prepare people for what Douglas, Douglas MacArthur in 1955 clearly stated would be World War III. So it's not that difficult. I mean, it's a very simple message, but what's complex is what I've been going through today, and that is figuring out what part of the data that's out there is ET, what part of it is man-made, and how do you tell the difference? And so, you know what? Sometimes you can't. Now, I can give you a little clue. If an interstellar craft is in the area, it's going to, and you see it where you can actually see the superstructure, the actual shape and material of the craft, it's seamless. The ones that are man-made have rivets, they have parts, they have seams, they have sections. You want to know why? How many people know why? Raise your hand if you think you know why. No, this will blow your mind. Okay, how much time do I have? Oh, I'm out of time? Oh, I could go on. Anyway, oh, no, we started late. No, no, we, no, 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 no. We, it's two hours from when I started, not from when they made me late. Okay. Okay, but this is the really cool shit. All right, this is the stuff we're going to be doing tomorrow night where you understand transdimensional manufacturing that are interstellar. So I have this, this great story of this captain I dealt with who uh, was there to retrieve an ET craft that was shot down in the South Atlantic in 1963. And he wouldn't come for, forward. He was told he would absolutely be erased and uh, terminated with extreme prejudice, which means killed, terped. And he didn't want to be turp, but he called me up and he says, Doc, you know, he's this old crusty guy. And he says, the thing I don't understand is that when we retrieved the pod that had these four bodies in it, and they were 39 inches tall, they were handsome little men, I'm quoting, and the skin color of a Sicilian, <laughs> politically incorrect even in a red state. And, and, uh, but they had no ears that are external, just an opening, no hair, 
And they were, um, he said, but they were handsome little men. And they were shot down because they were trying to slow down our development of intercontinental ballistic missiles. And uh, they got a lock and a triangulation from his ship's radar and the base radar, and they hit it uh, with an electronic weapon. But he, the, he says, the reason I'm calling you is that the damnedest thing has bothered me for 40 years. I said, what's that? He says, they had these suits on, and there was no way to get in and out of them. There was no zipper. There was no belt. There was no buckles. There was no buttons. And there's no way you could have gotten in and out of that damn thing. And I said, well, yes, sir, that's, they don't have clothing manufacturing like we have. He says, what do you mean? I said, well, that uniform is in itself a metallicized material that is, uh, has an electromagnetic field that connects with the bioelectric field that enables them to materialize and dematerialize without injury. And the, the, the uniform itself is materialized on them from subatomic materials from the zero point field by setting up a, a, a sonic tonal, a tonality that creates it to materializes around it. So there's nothing to manufacture. And I, by the way, if you were to look at their craft, he says, yes, the part they were in was like that too. There were no seams or parts. I said, that's how they manufacture things. So when we're getting, we go get a Ford, you dig up the iron and you smelt it, and it's very Bruegel-esque, isn't it? It's like a Bruegel painting. You know, we're like cavemen. You know Bruegel? Anyway, sorry. Um, so we have this primitive idea that manufacturing consists of digging junk up out of the earth, smelting it, welding it together, blah, blah, blah. That's not how interstellar civilizations create things because they have mastered the, in the Vedas, the ancient Sanskrit Vedas, they would be called the cities, S-I-D-D-H-I-S, is what we're going to be talking about a lot Sunday night, of how to create through resonant frequencies, both in consciousness but also augmented with electronics, a technology that would enable them to materialize anything they want, a spacecraft, a uniform, their food, and also, that enables them to be sol like a solid object like this. You put the correct electromagnetic resonant field around it, it will tilt a little bit out of linear space-time, go to another dimension, drop out of this space-time, and reappear in another galaxy very quickly. Mm. Communications are occurring by the consciousness and the thought being directed to an electromagnetic system that then conveys instantaneously anywhere in the universe under full reproducibilities, okay, and full, you know, accuracy. So that, that is how ETs are manufacturing and communicating. The reason that's important is that there are all these frightening scenarios. I had a discussion with Zachariah Sitchin some years ago about how the ETs came here and we were slaves digging up gold. I'm going, really? <laughs> well, let me tell you something. I have a disc from a CIA agent that has several thousand pages of patents on it. If anyone ever wants to fund a research lab for us, any billionaires in the room or millionaires, give me a jingle. I've got it. Okay, so, <laughs> and you can put metal, any metal, a tin can or whatever, in a microwave, adjust the frequency. You put in this orange powder that's very easily cre acquired. And at the right frequency, that you can move through transformation and it, it sounds like, you know, the elements, that you just go up the periodic chart through resonant frequencies, and if you want to take something that's uh, iron, you turn it into gold or platinum. Mm. Has that been done? Yeah, absolutely. It's been done in classified labs for decades. So what do you think, if that's the kind of stuff we can do, an interstellar civilization doesn't need to come here and create slaves out of us to dig gold up out of the ground. You see what I'm, you where I'm going here? All these fearsome ideas are, are, have, have, have propagation in the public because we're ignorant about science and technology and also of what the agenda is. So we need to become scientifically literate 
And also, when we're making contact with these civilizations, we need to understand that they're coming through one star system or galaxy through other dimensions. And here's the beauty of it. Those other dimensions are folded within every single one of us. All of it. Each human, from its unbounded conscious field, all the way to your physical body, has folded within it the entirety of everything that's in the cosmos and every dimension, not just material. And that's why we can make contact. And that's why we will make contact tomorrow night under the stars. I hope to see you there. Thank you.